We're going to continue our study in uh, the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, and we're looking at question number three, life's, calling it, subtitling it, Life's Priorities. Uh, before we do that, though, a preview of next week, uh, the fourth catechism. Anybody know what the fourth question is off the top of your head? It's one of the more uh, famous ones. What is God? What is God? So let's, uh, I'll ask the question and if you'll respond. What is God? Everybody's phone who doesn't have it on silent just got exposed. I think that was an uh, was it an Amber Alert? Yeah. Um, Broward. Where? Broward. Broward. Broward County. Um, all right. And this morning we are looking at question number three. What do the scriptures principally teach? So we, we see that the scriptures principally teach these two things, and we could summarize it into knowing God and serving God is what the scriptures principally teach. And in, in a lot of ways, as we think about this, it's a, it's a question about uh, what is truly important? And the Word of God is, we, we confess it to be our only rule of faith and practice for our church and, quite frankly, in our lives. And if this is what the Bible principally teaches, then it, it shows us uh, some of the priorities that the Word of God, that God has for us, the two primary uh, priorities. And just as a thought question here, how can you identify what is important to someone? If you wanted to dig into somebody's life and say, I want to know what's important to this person, what things would you look at? Checkbook. You'd look at the checkbook. All right, what else? What do they talk about? What do they talk about? So I'm, I'm going to put that under my heading of time and effort on. Both what are they talking about and then what are they spending their time on? If you say something's important to you, but you never spend any time on it, that's really just lip service. If there's no effort put into it, if there's no talking about it, and then checkbook, that's my second one, money spent on it. Anything else come to mind? If you want to know what, what somebody is, what's really important to them, I have one more. Anybody else have, have one? Well, I'm going to call it emotions. What, 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 what gets them excited? What, what depresses them? What ruins their day? I've known people that if they go to the Publix bakery and they don't have the exact treat they wanted, their day is ruined. There's a lot of people that when their favorite sports team loses, their day is ruined. Um, what, what gets you sad? What, what depresses you? What causes your emotions to come down? And on, on the converse of that, what, what gets you really excited? What, what uplifts your, your emotions? Um, I obviously, I use those two, two examples because uh, I love food. And uh, at times, uh, maybe I love food too much. And uh, experienced that when I was a young man uh, about the Publix Bakery. And also when I was a younger sports uh, was a big, big deal. I, I still like sports. I uh, don't watch a ton of sports anymore. But you know, when I was in high school, Sunday was football day. I got up and watched the pregame at 7 o'clock, and I watched the end of the night game at whatever time it ended and spent all day uh, watching football and talking about it. And, um, it, it. When my favorite team would lose with the world's greatest quarterback, which was John Elway, by the way, just for the record books, but um, I would get super, super sad. And you would know what was 
important to me. And when they finally won the Super Bowl, I it was I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Now looking back on it, it sort of makes me chuckle. It's obviously not that important. My life isn't better or worse because they win or they lost. But uh, you could have uh, identified very clearly what was important to me. As we think about it in this way, and as a challenger thinking this morning, what's important to you? If somebody were to investigate your life and were to look into the details of your life and, and look at even these things, what, w- what would they learn? And it's just a thought question uh, to, to ponder together. And do those priorities line up with what we find in the Word of God. So God's revelation reveals the priorities that we should have, that when we we look at the Scriptures and we say that the, the Scripture mainly teaches these two things, knowing God. Isn't that, you know, you think about where we've been in the Catechism, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Can you truly glorify God and enjoy him if you do not know him? You you think about the the all praise service we had and talking about God's protection. And most of us had some sort of testimony to the right person, sometimes the right thing, was in the right place at the right time. And we attribute that to God. Why do we attribute that to God? That person didn't magically appear. That person was there just in the normal flow of life. Why do we attribute that to God? It's because God is sovereign. Because God is ruling and overruling because of God's providence. We say in God's providence, uh, he had, uh, you know, in the case of my father-in-law, he had somebody working with him who was strong and knew CPR and could you know, do that until uh, paramedics arrived. And so knowing God helps us to glorify God. It allows us to glorify God. When we think about his power in connection to that, that all things, there's nothing outside the power of God. So knowing God, and then, of course, it says also serving God, the duty that he requires of us. And that's not just negatively phrased, which is how, particularly Satan, would like us to think about it. God just tells you you can't do all these things because he doesn't want you to have any fun. That's the lie of the world, the flesh, and the devil. God's word says, yes, there are things we should not do because they are not good, because they are sin, because they go against the character of God, but we're to be busy about his business. There is a lot to do in our lives. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it heartily, as unto the Lord. And that applies to every area of life. And this reveals for us what our priorities are. There's no greater thing than knowing God and serving God. And we we can get so caught up. We live in a society where we have more free time than any society in the history of the world. I think that's a pretty fair statement when you, you think about the fact that today, um, you know, how many of you had to go get water this morning? How many of you had to feed your animals, which are your, your primary food, food source? Uh, so, and so on and, and so forth. When I was out in Oregon, there was a family who they lost electricity, and so they had to milk 500 goats by hand um, because that's what they do for a living. Now, most of us just benefit from people who, who are doing that, but... Uh, so they weren't at church that Sunday morning, and pastor teacher said, if anybody wants to go milk some goats, let me know. Of course, they're professionals, and they were done by the time church was over, and they just had to keep the refrigerators running. Uh, how many of you had to worry about if your refrigerator was running this morning? Ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Every time I say that, somebody's refrigerator breaks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Becky. I think it was been your fridge twice. Um, it's still off? I'm sorry. I got to think of better examples. But, um, right, we, we don't. We, we, we have such amount of free time. Now, I say free time, and a lot of you are probably thinking, you don't know how busy I am. But think about how many of those things are choices that we make. We choose to do this. We choose to do that. 
throughout most of human history, there wasn't a lot of choice. It was, if I don't do these things today and every day, we're not going to eat. And so as we have that amount of free time, how are we using it? We have more access to entertainment than ever. And that's not hyperbole. Because you can watch TV 24-7, 366 days out of 2020, because it was a leap year. You can just do it all the time. I said that wrong, didn't I? Did I say 200? I meant to say 300. But anyways, right? We can just watch it constantly around, around the clock. And is that a good use of our time? Is that knowing God? Is that serving God to, to think about it that way? So first, let's think about knowing God. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. As I, I referenced, uh, mentioned last week, a catechism like this, entire books could be written on. In fact, entire books have been written on. They're called systematic theologies because we're talking about what the, the whole scope of Scripture is. And so to dig into this, we, we would have to look at all of Scripture. We're just going to look at a few key principles this morning that show this truth. Um, I have no idea how I'm going to handle next week. I don't know if that's a one-off catechism answer. That's such a deep catechism question, such a profound question uh, that, that we'll look at, uh, at least in part, next week. So knowing God, 2 Timothy, yes, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Paul says, And be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Thereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And it is uh, verse 14 now, that good thing which was committed unto thee, kept by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. So the, the scripture proof from the catechism is verses 13 and, and 14. Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, kept by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. That we, we see there he used to hold fast to the, the form of, of sound words, to the right doctrine that he has received. Now, you notice in the flow that we can say Paul was dedicated to ministry. There can be no doubt that the Apostle Paul was dedicated to the ministry in verses 11 or 8 through 11. We know he was dedicated to the ministry. Why? Because he was willing to suffer. I guess that's one thing I left off, isn't it? We looked about all these things, but what are you willing to suffer for? Paul was suffering at this point as he writes 2 Timothy. He's in jail. And what we believe happened to him is he suffered the martyr's death. That everything that's written here, Paul wrote with his blood, John Calvin says, and that he gave his life for this ministry, for, for this God. He, he was dedicated to it. He says, don't be ashamed of me. He says, because I've done this, notice what he says, according to the power of God. He says, this is, this is the work of God. This is what God is doing. And he could have such confidence in this because Paul knew God in verse 12. He says, for the which God, I am also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, which is a verse we know. It's in a song we love. But, but notice he says, I, I'm going to suffer all these things. 
I'm going to go through all these things because I know my God. And I know that my God is able to take this affliction and use it for the furtherance of the kingdom. I know that it is a, a privilege to stand firm for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Society and governments put people in jail to discourage the behavior that they've done. Now, sometimes that is uh, been used for good. Somebody's a criminal in, in the truest sense of the word. Certainly they should be put in jail. Other times, governments put people in jail who have no business being there, and it's a, a very uh, tragic thing. We look at the Apostle Paul. Um, he spent a lot of time in jail. At this point, he's in jail. He's going to be killed. You could look at Paul, and uh, before Paul was in jail, before his first imprisonment in Jerusalem, which took years and years to figure out, he got free for a few years, and then uh, he's in jail again. What did Paul do from his the, the time he was saved until that imprisonment? What was his life busy doing? Preaching. Preaching. Planting churches, being an apostle, doing the work of the Lord, and going. I mean, you read in Acts, he's traveling everywhere. I, I think sometimes we don't appreciate how exhausting that was. Uh, I was reading uh, a little devotional this morning that suggested uh, 12 to 15 miles was a single day's journey. When was the last time you walked or ran 12 miles in a single day? Now, they probably didn't run it. Anybody run 12 miles recently? Danielle, have you? Uh, she doesn't want to admit it, but working towards it or something. But uh, any, anybody else, you, you walk 12 miles lately in one day? We got those fancy trackers today. I got to look the last time I walked four miles in, in a single day. But, but that was Paul. Okay, he's going from city to city to city to city. He's walking most of the way. Exhausting, going everywhere, doing all this work. And then he gets falsely accused and he gets thrown in jail in Jerusalem. He's put into protective custody, so on and so forth. And it just seems like, what can he do from jail? Well, what did Paul keep doing? Preaching. Keep preaching. He said, oh, I'm chained to a Roman soldier. This is great. <laughs> and what did he do? He evangelized that Roman soldier. Philippians 1 has the testimony about this that, that you can look at. The other thing I think he did is I think he, he was an interest. He was a, an investigative kind of person. He liked people. He talked to people. And you want to bet he found out about every piece of armor that soldier had, which then turns into what? The Lord uses the whole armor of God. Anybody ever been chained to somebody else for a day? And I'm not talking about the ball and chain that Bill Suter brings out for their anniversary. But, you know, he's trained, to, you know, chained to a soldier. Uh, and, and he says, okay, this is great. My father-in-law, uh, Steve Sudlow, I, I mentioned last Sunday night, when he, uh, when he had the tumor and then seizures and the brain sur surgery, before he did that, he was a, a truck driver for Publix. And after that, he could not do that. One of the jobs that he had at Publix was uh, training truck drivers. And I remember him saying one Wednesday, and I said, pray for me because I've got a mission field this week and they can't get away from me. We're stuck. He, he looked at it. You know, he wanted to drive that truck. He wanted to go do that again, but he couldn't. And so he said, how can I serve the Lord with where I'm at? Paul did that. And, and look at that. And Paul didn't say, well, this was a waste. We don't look at it and we shouldn't look at it and say, well, couldn't have Paul done so much more? No, because we know whom we've believed, and, and this is what God has for him. And therefore, there's a, a ministry that is needful and that's important. Uh, the prison epistles that wrote, Paul wrote from prison, including 2 Timothy, which we don't usually categorize as a prison epistle. Technically, it's a pastoral epistle that he writes to Timothy, along with 1 Timothy and Titus. But th this is he wrote from prison. He had the time to write this in some sense because he was in prison. So Paul knew God. He was dedicated to that ministry. So you see both of them right there, right? Knowing God, serving God. They, they go hand in hand with one another. And also he exhorts Timothy to follow the sound words in verse 13, which is uh, normally 
would, would, you would look at that humanly speaking and say that's bad advice because Paul's telling Timothy, come join me in prison. Because he's telling Timothy, do the thing that I did that got me here. But God is worth our service and is suffering. And so he was to follow the sound words. You notice that it says, hold fast to the form of sound words. He says, cling to the doctrine, cling to the teaching of scripture, that we are to know God. Of course, we can add that we have the Holy Spirit. We're not in this battle alone. Paul wasn't in this battle alone. We are not in this battle alone. When Paul gives great testimony, he says, I know how to be content. I know how to be a base. I know how to be lifted up. I know how to be full. I know how to be hungry, which is uh, this, this contentment, this rare jewel of the Christian faith. But it comes to us by knowing God and by the work of the Holy Spirit. So you see these things, and I have this note here, service driven by knowing God. Is God worth suffering for? Yes. And if I'd, I'd encourage, I'd, I don't think I have a, and we'll run out of time anyways, but Philippians chapter one is just a, a, a beautiful passage about Paul's attitude towards being in jail. He says, all of Caesar's household has heard the gospel, that others are, the other Christians are, are bold because of my bonds and what the Lord has done through me. And then, so knowing God, and then the second one is uh, serving God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, this came up last week when we were looking at uh, sort of the doctrine of, of Scripture and the second catechism question. We, we didn't spend a lot of time on this verse, so let's dig in a little bit more on these three verses. Notice verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through, fi through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, that the scriptures uh, make us wise unto salvation. They teach us about Jesus. They teach us about the way of salvation. They show us the need for faith. It's what the Spirit uses ordinarily to bring people to faith is through the preaching, the teaching, the reading, the studying of the Word of God, that this is why God has given it, we might say, and, and as we think about serving God, serving God starts with salvation, starts with faith. Without faith, it's impossible to serve God. In verse 16, we read that the Bible is profitable. So here is the, you might look at it this way, the, the primary reason why God has given us the Bible. There's four things that he lists. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now we would call that knowing God. It is profitable for doctrine. It is profitable for knowing what sin is, knowing what righteousness is, the, the sound words that we are to hold fast to. It's profitable also for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and we might think about that as serving God. We use the word of God for reproof, to tell people when they're breaking God's law. It's one of the reasons that God has given it to us. For correction, which we might think of as repentance, turning from sin and walking with the Lord, even the way to seek forgiveness. And then also for instruction in righteousness, the way in which uh, we should live. So the Bible is profitable for knowing God and for, for serving God. Anybody have a, a question or anything? I saw some movement there. I didn't know, Dan, if you had something you wanted to, to throw in. Sorry, misread you there. Um, and then verse 17, the Bible equips us for every good work. As it talks about this, we, we see this summarized, that the man of God may be perfect. Now, the word perfect there does not mean uh, like sinless perfection or absolute righteousness. The word per perfect here means maturity, able to do what you need to do. What, what does it mean to be mature? 
what it means is to be able to function, to be able to act. So when, when we see Hezekiah walking around and we see Hezekiah talking, Hezekiah can communicate, but he's not mature yet. He, sometimes it's hard to understand what he's saying. I imagine you have a harder time than I do because I'm around him all the time. But even I, he came to me last night and was saying something I have, I have no idea what, what he was saying. It was, maybe he had something and somebody else figured it out. Right? He's not mature yet. So when we read perfect here, it, it's mature. It's able to function. And it even goes on to say thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So I've summarized it. The Bible equips us for all good works. Now, this is not to say that when the Bible speaks to, for instance, something in, in science that is wrong or something in geography or something in history. Let's be very clear. The Bible is inspired by God and therefore is inerrant. And when the Bible speaks to something, whether that's creation or that's some piece of history, it is always accurate. Man is often wrong. And uh, I saw a quote on Facebook that was attributed to you from your son, John. Man has his theory and God has his truth. That's a, a wonderful way to, to say. We've, we've experienced that throughout uh, even, even the COVID situation where there was uh, lots of ideas of how to handle it. And some of those things turned out okay. Some of those things turned out not so good, even in the treatment side of things. They, they learned, they've learned a lot of things and uh, they had theory. Of course, God has his truth. He knows. His word is true. So it is reliable. As we look at the scriptures, we want to understand God's intent for us and what he has for us, even as it fulfills uh, allowing us to be equipped for every good work. And if you think about the flow here, you have to have faith to do a good work. You have to have faith to serve God. So that's the first step. Then you need knowledge and understanding and, and growing in those things. Verse 16, and so that we would be serving God. Thankfully, to the praise of our glorious God, we're never alone in these tasks, but we can look to the Lord our God in all things and know that he's working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you.